Okay, could you imagine what society would be like if human beings did not have a conscience? It'd be pretty scary. Psychopathic killer, murder, oh no conscience, no mean? ability to distinguish between right and wrong. I'm arguing that if you do have a conscience, there's got to be some type of God who gave that conscience to you. No, 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 what? that's not true at all. What? Okay. Does a conscience tell you what is objectively good? How can there be objective good if there is no God? In, in codifying exactly what is good and what is bad, we also tell ourselves what is also good and what is also bad. So if my culture tells me that to put my female baby out in the snow to freeze to death is good, does that make it good? Uh, to you, as a Westerner, no it does not. To that particular society which has said that yes you can do that, then according to those societal norms, it is appropriate to do that. If my Western society tells me that three that black people are three fifths the value of white people, does that make it good? No. Once again, according to your definition, it does not. But according to, say, for instance, the definitions of what was right and wrong a hundred years ago in the United good. States, yes, it was perfectly right. right. So, if the Nazi Germans would have won, won World War II, and if they would have destroyed all people that opposed Dachau and Auschwitz, then gassing Jews would be good. Once again, according to that specific set of mores, yes, it might have been good for them. But actually, that is actually not completely true. Even to them, it was wrong, because at the end of World War II, when the United States came and the Russians came into Germany and liberated those concentration camps, they are actually caught red-handed, setting fire and destroying evidence. So while to us, on the outside, yeah, it may have been perceived to be, have been good on their end, it was not good because they themselves were trying to cover up their own immoral acts. Furthermore, there is actually a logical fallacy because referring to a an instance where there is such a clear right and wrong and attempting to disprove my own thoughts, that um, is attempting to invalidate my arguments by going backwards to something that's so obviously wrong. And I insist you cannot live out that moral relativism consistently. Oh, I can. I do it all the time. I'm an atheist. Uh -huh. I haven't murdered anybody yet. No. You've missed my entire point. My entire point is not atheist murder people. It's not the point. Okay, then what is your point, please? My point is, if there is no God, the existence of moral truth is a farce. If there is no God, morality is subjective, depending upon the individual, depending on the culture, which means nothing's objectively right, nothing's objectively wrong. Okay. It's all a matter of the individual or the culture defining it a certain way. Right, sure. Okay. I don't think you can live that out. Why? I think that if someone rapes your sister, you're not going to be able to honestly think from my perspective, that was wrong. But from the rapist position, it's right. It's all relative. Actually, you can't. No, according to him, it may be perfectly legitimate and right. According to my definition, it is wrong. According to society's definition, it is wrong. Therefore, society itself will go after that individual and put him in jail. Now, say, for instance, according to a Western civilization, and the age of consent for somebody is 18 years old. Go to the Middle East, it is as young as 12 years old. Okay. So say, for instance, if an older male marries this female and consummates said marriage, according to their social mores, it is 100% correct. According to our social mores, it is 100% wrong. Even rape itself is dictated by social mores. Not too long ago, in India, sute was practiced. The widow was burned on the pyre with her husband's body. For that culture, at that point, it was right. Does that make it objectively right? According, once again, okay, so 
You're bringing my ancestors into this now. Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> so Sute, um, as, the, as, as this gentleman has said, um, was the practice where Hindus, when the husband died first, the female would also be put to death at the funeral pyre. Okay? Personally, I think this is completely atrocious. Furthermore, that is a small subsect, subsect, the sort of um, a small um, extremist sect of Hinduism. Which, by the way, I believe was completely wrong. According to their social mores, yes, that was right. According to the rest of the world, in the British Empire at the time, it was wrong, and those people were actually shot to pieces, but that's neither here nor there. Now, my point is, my observation and my experience of life is, you don't have to follow your culture. I don't have to follow my culture. In fact, I have the greatest respect for Gandhi, who chose to violate his culture and to follow his conscience instead of his culture. Now, why did Gandhi follow his conscience instead of his culture? Because he was convinced that his culture was wrong and that his conscience was telling him that which is true. Okay, in regards to what? British rule? The caste system? Gandhi stood against the caste system, valiantly, wonderfully. Why? His conscience told him, my culture is wrong. Gandhi critiqued his own self, his own life, when he lived in South Africa. He was brutally honest about, gosh, I bought into some racist attitudes. I am sorry. He followed his conscience. He allowed his conscience to tell him what was objectively real he critiqued his culture and he critiqued himself. Okay, now let's take Gandhi for example. You're using Gandhi as a, a measure of that which is morally right. You're appealing to a higher authority, which is yet another. No, logical. I'm not. You're saying no, I'm not. You're not. I'm using Gandhi as an illustration of one individual, and I hope you're just like Gandhi, and I hope I'm like Gandhi, in that we can exercise our conscience to contradict the morals of our culture, and we can say to our culture, we can say to the majority, you're wrong with Sute. You are wrong with a caste system. You are wrong with enslaving Africans in America. That is wrong. Your racism is wrong. Why? Because I have a conscience that ties me into objective morals. My point is, then, the only way there can be an objective moral is if there is some type of god or gods who create and define the value of a human life and the value of justice. The value of human life has been completely subjective throughout history. And once again, according to Hindus, social mores, and culture, Gandhi, um, after he died, went to a higher level of consciousness. Yeah, yeah. Now, according to Christian beliefs, he was going to hell because he didn't get baptized. No. Or he didn't... Or he didn't, um, he didn't put his the... faith in Christ. That would be the argument. Okay, but that's a totally different issue. The issue we're right now is not Jesus. The issue is atheism. You said you're an atheist. Yeah. And I'm trying to show you that you can't live out your moral relativism consistently. Okay, now how do you as a scientist scientifically prove what is good and just and right? Um, once again, okay. you can't. Actually, you can. No, you can't. Um, how do you scientifically prove what is good? Okay, there was a study done about 10 years ago where they took, um, where they took uh, different people and they put them to a PET scanner, which is positron emission topography. They radio label glucose and then they put it into a person. And then they have the person make various moral decisions. Okay? And say for instance, and, they, and so they would do things like say for instance, my favorite experiment was you have one man okay, on, next to a railroad track. Okay. The train is coming and it's going to kill three other guys. Uh -huh. You could either push that man into, into the way of that train uh -huh. and kill him like this yeah. and save those three guys. Yeah. Okay. Now say for instance, you could do the same thing, only all you have to do is flip a switch. Yeah. Okay. Now, when the person was confronted with that decision, they felt it to be more difficult to actually push that man into that train. However, if they was flipping a switch, it would be very easy to do that. So in that sense, the needs of the many, as they say in Star Trek, outweigh the needs of the few. Okay? It would be more morally correct to kill one person to save three. Now say for instance, that person would know it is the right thing to do in order to save those three people, but it is more, but it would not sit as well with their conscience if they actually had to actively do it. And when they did, when they put these moral dilemmas into these, and confronted these people, the different parts of their brains were activated. So? Okay. So, conscience is actually hardwired into our minds. Okay, good. I agree. Okay. 
Uh huh. But you just said that I couldn't prove it. That proves no, that there is a conscience. You still have no, no, no. You cannot scientifically prove justice. Okay. Now, further. Justice is not a scientific postulate. Okay. Justice is a philosophical, theological concept. It's an intangible value. It's not. You don't get a pound of justice in your science lab. You can watch the way the brain reacts. Sure. You can notice that we're hardwired. Sure. But that still doesn't change the fact that I have a free will to respect you, or I, I can choose to use my free will to be disrespectful. Okay. And if I smack you in the face and someone says, hey man, why'd you smack him? And I said, because I had to. My biological makeup forced me to smack him. Okay. I'm lying. Okay, now, now, so you're saying that the evidence of consciousness, or consci conscience, sorry, conscience, right. you got me mixed up doing it now. I blame you. Thank you. He was the guy who <laughs> confused me. All right, I'm just using All right, so you're saying that evidence of a deity is based in the inability for me to prove that there is a conscience. No, it's not what I'm saying. I'm saying look at your life. Okay. Science, wonderful branch of knowledge. Okay. Logic, not scientific, logic. The ability to think rationally. Another wonderful branch of knowledge. History, not based on science, based on the trustworthiness of an eyewitness testimony. You don't scientifically prove that Washington was first president of the United States in a lab here at the University of Arizona every September. No. You study eyewitness testimony, wonderful branch of knowledge, conscience, the ability to understand right and wrong, not scientifically provable, and experience. There, you have sense experience that you use in science, sight, touch, empiricism, but then when it comes to moral experience, it's not based on science, it's based on your experience of life. You experience a conscience that says, you know something, it's Sute is objectively wrong. Gandhi, in fighting the caste system, did that which is absolutely objectively right, standing for the dignity of all of human life. But then you gotta ask yourself, wait a second, these values of human dignity, of justice, what are they? What's the basis of them? Are they real or are they just subjective? If there is no God, they're subjective. I create my own values, you create your own values, Gandhi creates his own values. It's all subjective. It is. And in terms of being subjective, I can look at Gandhi's mores and decide that, yeah, I do agree with this. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. But say, for instance, if I was a psychopath, as many other psychopaths have done in the past, yes. what they will do is that they will decide that that set of mores doesn't apply to me. I'm instead, and actually there's a couple of serial killers that have done this, will actually study Ted Bundy, uh -huh. Theodore Kaczynski, right. and other psychopaths at the time, and, and adopt their own twisted set of mores based off of them. Yes. Okay. Okay. Now, going back to what you said previously, uh -huh. while I disagree with what, you, what you're arguing, is that according to, in my opinion, what you're saying is that um, you cannot prove that I, I cannot go to my lab and, right. and prove that, um, that justice that justice exists right exactly. or that conscience exists yeah now my own opinion well, not really opinion actually the opinion of me and my se several scientific brethren right uh, we actually have these conversations for fun if you can believe that I like it um, is that lack of evidence of something is not evidence to the contrary okay okay um, in my opinion, which my, my interpretation of what you're saying is that I cannot prove this, therefore it is evidence of a deity. No, 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 no. That's not the point. The point is... is that what he's saying? No. No, it's... No, let me... Let me start to... <laughs> my point is every single one of you experiences a conscience. Your conscience informs you. There are, not, maybe not many, but there are a few objective morals. But look at guys, you study anthropology, we're all reading off the same sheet of music in one sense. Adultery, rape, murder, around the world are unacceptable. Why? Because the human conscience informs people it's wrong. My conscience says he's a human being. Right. But my racist environment says he's not white, so smack him. Now I got a decision to make. I follow my conscience or my culture. What? I got a free will, and guess what? I don't have to follow my conscience. And guess what? I don't have to follow my environment either, or my culture. I have to choose. Am I going to follow my conscience and respect him as a fellow human being created in the image of God? 
or am I going to follow my culture, which says white supremacy? And I got to choose. All right, now, I think that your culture, the reason why you have not, um, that you are not smacking me silly right now, is that your culture, as being a member of the, you know, as, as a citizen of the United States, um, our culture dictates that I am equal to you, even though I have a darker skin tone. Right. right? And then you have adopted these set of mores. It is not a source of some, it, is, it does not come from a deity. Now, um, I'll, 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 let, me, let me get back to one point and then I actually have to go to work. You bet. Um, I have well, to go It's been a work. delight talking with you. Likewise. But I'll make, I'll make one more point. Um, in that a conscience or a conscience has been placed inside of you by, by your God. Um, God has given all of us a conscience. Okay. Well, but not if morality is relative. Now, come on, guys, be consistent. If morality is relative, then the conscience is just a subjective taste. That's okay. all it is. Uh, Just taste. Please uh, allow me to finish. Um, so, um, what happens is that, um, in my opinion, what is what is going on, and, and, and I respect you, but I fundamentally disagree with you, is that you are saying that something cannot be proved, um, and, and the source of. And, okay, so your conscience or a conscience that's been placed inside of all of us, in my opinion, is a product of our experiences, social mores, and, it's, and, um, and genetic factors as well. So it's nature and nurture, okay? Those two facets which form us into who we are as an individual. Now, what happens is that, in my opinion, we cannot prove that a conscience has been placed into us by, um, by nature. So many then attribute it to a deity. Um, but as, but same thing has been applied to several scientific principles over the millennia, whether it be the tides, whether it be weather, so on and so forth. But in my opinion, the, the logical fallacy there is that lack of evidence is not evidence to the contrary. So you cannot attribute this to a deity because who knows, in 20, 30 years from now, we may unlock the, what, exactly what conscience is. So You still have missed my point. I don't think I no, have. It's not, yes, so, you have. The so, conscience informs me of an objective moral. So, yes, and, and the only way there can be an, and now this, and just please get this, the only way there can be an objective moral, separate from me, separate from you, is, is if a creating mind, a moral lawgiver, has created and defined that objective moral. Okay. It's the conscience that puts me in touch with, not God, it puts me in touch with that objective moral. Then my rational mind asks me, how can that objective moral exist? Obviously, there's only one way if there is a God, a moral lawgiver, who creates that moral ob objective moral. Well, um, you're assuming I will, so I'll finish, I'll finish off my other point, then I'll make one quick more, then I really have to get to work. So, um, so anyways, going back to what I was say, saying before, is that if evidence to the contrary, evidence, so evident, lack of evidence is not evidence to the contrary. So by that rationale, the evidence that there is a creator is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller over time. Now, going back to what you're saying right now, in terms of anthropology, us as a society, okay, say for instance, you got two groups. Group A is a group of psychopaths. Group B is a group of people who have a moral standard. Group A is going to end up offing each other or disintegrating because they have no fabric to hold them together. The group B that is a group of people who have a, a set of mores can say, for instance, can then form a social fabric, form a government, form a set of laws, for a, a, a group of morals for them to live by. Which of the two groups is going to prevail? The group that's not going to have any social fabric because it's going to be everybody from themselves, they're going to just disperse. The second group is going to form a fabric and then they're going to be able to prevail. So why do you help handicapped people? I help handicapped people, and I myself am actually handicapped as well, uh -huh. uh, because it is the right thing to do, and it's what my conscience says. So. Thank you. Which disproves what you were just arguing. Which proves exactly what it says. No, it does not. It does not. Come on, sir. If it's true that morality is based, as you were arguing, in what's going to benefit the species, how does it benefit the species to help handicapped people? It drains the few natural resources we have. Okay, say you instance. help handicap people because you know it's right. And okay. you said it beautifully, magnificently. Because you know with your conscience that it is good and right to right. help handicap people. Help what about my little handicapped friends who are nowhere near the intellectual capacity of a Stephen Hawking? See, your argument then is, oh, good, great. So handicapped people are valuable because of Stephen Hawking's intellectual brilliance. Baloney.
That is not why handicapped people are valuable, sir. Every single person. And your value has nothing to do with your IQ or your GPA. It has to do with the fact that you are a human being created by God for a purpose. And I could give a rip that you're a grad student and that you've taught ethics. That has nothing to do with your value. You're a human being created in the image of God. That's why you're valuable. And that's the difference between our worldviews. One day a young man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus asked him, Well, what is written in the law? How do you read it? And the man responded, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said, Very good. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. And so the man asked, Well, who's my neighbor? And Jesus said, A man was going down the road from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was accosted by thieves. They beat him up, robbed him blind, and left him in a puddle of blood on the side of the road. A very religious Jewish man came by. He saw his fellow Jew lying in a puddle of blood on the side of the road. He was too busy. He didn't want to risk anything, so he ignored the man and kept right on going. Then, Jesus said, another religious man came along. He saw his fellow Jew lying in a puddle of blood. He too was too busy. He didn't want to take the risk, for possibly the thieves who had beaten up that man were hiding behind the rock, ready to pounce on any passerby who would stop and give the man attention and help. So he kept right on going. And then Jesus said, a Samaritan came by. You must understand there was all types of racial tension between Jews and Samaritans in first century Palestine. Jews viewed Samaritans as half-breeds, half Jew, half Gentile, mixed ethnic heritage, and there was tons of racial tension between the two groups. But Jesus said this Samaritan, when he saw the man lying in a puddle of blood on the side of the road, stopped, got down off his horse, got on his hands and knees, and cleaned out the cuts and bandaged the wounds of the Jew. Then Jesus said to the man, go and do likewise. That is what it means to be a neighbor, to love. What is an illusion? An illusion is a mistaken impression about reality. Illusions are dangerous because illusions separate us from what is real and what is true. That is why knowledge is so important. Knowledge is crucial because knowledge ties us into reality. Too many people have concluded that all of reality is matter and energy. And that is why loving people, which means sacrificing for people, is viewed as stupid, foolish. Because too many people have reduced reality to matter and energy evolved to a higher order. Jesus Christ insisted that matter and energy are real and our bodies are real because God created us with bodies. But he also insisted that the ability to love, which is to freely choose to sacrifice for someone else, is equally real. And Jesus pointed out that if you think that life is simply a biochemical reaction, you're going to be a very empty, lonely, isolated person. You're going to bump into reality, and reality will hurt you because you have false view of reality. You reduce reality to simply stimulating your nerve endings and making money. Jesus Christ pointed out that there's more to life than that. Christ insisted that the purpose of life is to love God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. That is real. That is good. So Jesus Christ confronts you and me with a radically different worldview from materialism. Materialism says that the objective of life is to amass wealth and then to live a physically comfortable life. Jesus Christ says no. Jesus Christ says the purpose of life is to know and love God and to love and serve other people. Are you in touch with reality? Or are you living an illusion which is a mistaken view of reality? Make no mistake about it, Jesus claimed to know truth. And Jesus calls you and me to put our faith in Him and then to allow Him to connect us with the living God and then to allow Him to change us from the inside out, to become the good people He created us to be. I have never been on a university campus where there is a department for becoming a good person. And what is so tragic is, is to listen to people say, well, the only way to know truth is through science. That is totally false. Your family and my family is not based on science. Your family and my family is based on trust. It's based on love. 
It's based on kindness, all of which are intangible values that science has nothing to say about. What is a good person? A good person is not someone who understands chemistry and physics. Chemistry and physics are wonderful branches of knowledge, but a good person is someone who understands what it means to be humble and to trust another person, to be a person of integrity, of honesty. All you gotta do is read the obituaries. What are good obituaries about? Are they about hairstyle? Are they about pure skin, clear skin? No, they're about the character of the person, how the person lived their life. Were they good or were they not? I think it's fascinating to listen to scientists talk. Talk about what a jerk that partner is. What an idiot my employer is. Yes, you and I as human beings know very well that life is all about character, goodness, love, integrity. And science is a wonderful branch of knowledge, but it's a very narrow branch that focuses on material reality. And that is important, very important. But there's more to reality than just matter and energy. There are incredible intangible values like love and kindness and goodness and integrity that are very crucial to your life and to my life. Jesus says that God loves you. He revealed that God is a gracious God. You and I have gotten separated from God, but God longs to woo us to himself, not to force us, but to woo us. He sent his son Christ to bleed and die on a cross to forgive us for our cosmic treason. Christ rose from the dead. The evidence is he's reliable. You can trust him and not sacrifice your intellect. Isn't it time for you to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ? God bless you as you make that most important decision. I'm the pastor of Grace Community Church. We meet every Sunday morning, 9.30 at Saks Middle School in New Canaan, Connecticut. Take the Merritt Parkway to exit 37, go to the end of the ramp, take a left onto Route 124, go approximately one mile and take a right into Saks Middle School. I'd love to invite you to join us this Sunday, 9.30. Thanks for joining us for these few minutes. Have a great day.